I was in the OK Corral at 2.30 p.m. when I saw the two Clantons and the two McLowrys in an earnest conversation across the street in Dunbar's Corral. I went up the street and notified Sheriff Behan and told him it was my opinion they meant trouble, and it was his duty, as sheriff, to go and disarm them. I told him they had gone to the West End Corral. I then went and saw Marshal Virgil Earp and notified him to the same effect. I then met Billy Allen, and we walked through the OK Corral, about 50 yards behind the sheriff. On reaching Fremont Street, I saw Virgil Earp, Wyatt Earp, Morgan Earp, and Doc Holliday in the center of the street, all armed. Johnny Behan had just left the Cowboys after having a conversation with them. I heard Virg Earp say, give up your arms or throw up your arms. There was some reply made by Frank Lowry when firing became general, over 30 shots being fired. So begins the most famous gunfight of the Old West. The lawmen, including the Earp brothers and the hastily recruited Holiday, faced off against the Clantons and McClory's. It's a scene that has been often repeated on screen and in books. The true story was not a simple tale of good guys in white hats fighting bad guys in black hats. You don't need to exaggerate the facts of the gunfight at the OK Corral, which wasn't really in a corral at all, in order to find an exciting story of men and women trying to build a good life in a hard world, and sometimes needing to do so at gunpoint. And this was just one of the many such confrontations as the American frontier was pushed ever westward and as a courageous few put their lives on the line to bring law to the lawless. These are the lawmen of the West. The obvious question, when one considers the West, is west of what? During the colonial era, the colonies themselves were carved out of the original wildlands, what we now think of as the East. The frontier was their backyard, the wilderness just at the edge of the coastal settlements. Law and order weren't maintained by extensive government-funded police forces, but by local constables and sheriffs, supported by citizens who might be drafted for night watch duties or to form a posse. The threat to order was generally not what modern audiences would call crimes. Robbery, rape, and murder weren't non-existent, but were less common. The day-to-day -day concerns were more along the lines of watching out for fires, working on the Sabbath, and cursing in public. In general, the citizens of the colonies were expected to police themselves. The colonists were generally people with similar background 
rules and often strict religious codes. And the truth was, there wasn't much to steal. The colonists needed to band together within their settlements to face the threats from outside. The Native American tribes, whose land the colonists were claiming as their own. Though the colonists were able to form friendly relations with some Indian tribes, other tribes saw the threat that the Europeans posed and met that threat with force. The Indian warriors had no knowledge of, nor interest in, the European rules of war. They fought in an entirely different style than Europe's traditional massed armies. Indians used surprise attacks, striking from concealment and avoiding pitched battles. To defend the colonies, governors established local militias. Every able-bodied male was expected to serve in the militia, and every home was expected to have at least one working firearm. These men were America's original citizen soldiers. From the late 1600s, almost up to the American Revolution, there were a series of wars between English colonials and French colonials, each having their own allies among the Native American tribes. The most famous is the last one, known in America simply as the French and Indian War, ending in 1763. One young man who fought in that war would later become known as one of the greatest frontiersmen in American history. While working as a teamster for British forces during the conflict, Daniel Boone heard of a marvelous land to the west, overflowing with bear, deer, turkey, and other game. After the war, Boone and a small party crossed the Appalachians to explore the wilderness of Kentucky. They hunted and lived off the land for months before being captured by the Shawnee, who seized all of the pelts the hunters had collected. Despite being warned to never return to the area, Boone continued exploring and hunting in Kentucky. In 1773, he led an expedition of about 50 colonists seeking to establish a settlement west of the Appalachians. The expedition was attacked by a band of Delawares, Cherokee, and Shawnee, who captured Boone's oldest son and one other member of the party. The young men were tortured to death, and the expedition was abandoned. But two years later, Boone led another expedition, and this time successfully founded the town of Boonesboro. Meanwhile, relations between the colonies and Parliament had fallen apart. The war had begun. In Kentucky, the battles were primarily between the colonists and the British-backed Native American tribes. Though we might tend to think of conflict between the tribes and settlers as being battles, there are aspects of it that were consistent with the lawlessness of the frontier that is more typically associated with the Wild West. Though colonial and later U.S. military units might engage the natives in battles, there weren't the professional, full-time investigative or enforcement agencies that we expect today. A town marshal or county sheriff would handle most issues related to law and order with minimal assistance from unpaid night watchmen, or perhaps a few deputies in a larger city. Actions requiring a larger force meant rounding up a party of volunteers for a specific mission. This was somewhat similar to the U.S. military in the early years of the nation. It is difficult to fully understand in the modern era how important the military at that time was to the internal security of the nation. But they had only a small number of professional soldiers and they had to rely heavily on untrained militia. This resulted 
in a disastrous defeat in 1791. At the time, there were troubles with the native peoples in both the Southwest and the Northwest, though the problems were more severe to the North. The British had ceded the Northwest Territory to America as part of the Treaty of Paris. This territory included lands that would one day be the states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and a portion of Minnesota, and it was already populated by various Indian tribes who had been British allies in the war. Angry over American settlers encroaching on their lands, the tribes reformed the Western Confederacy. Indian raids were answered by settler attacks, each growing more vicious. In 1790 and 1791, small combined forces of regular American troops and state militias moved against the Western Confederacy and suffered brutal losses. Of the 1,400 men fighting under St. Clair, almost half were killed and hundreds were wounded. It was a devastating defeat. Incidents such as these created a sense of terror among the citizens of the new nation with regard to the natives with whom they shared the land. But despite their fear, waves of settlers continued to roll west. Boone had been one of the great pathfinders, leading settlers to unexplored territories in the west. But it wasn't long before the nation doubled in size thanks to the Louisiana Purchase. And the borders kept moving outward and waves of settlers pushed into the new Western territories. But the U.S. was also repeatedly forced to deal with the fact that the land it acquired already had residence with an older claim. During the early 1800s, there was a pan-Indian movement led by the Shawnee war leader Tecumseh and his brother who was known as the Prophet. They traveled through the Southeast calling for all of the Native American tribes to put aside their quarrels and focus on a single goal, stopping the expansion of the European Americans and their government. Everywhere our people have passed away as the snow of the mountains melts in May. We no longer rule the forest. The game has gone like our hunting grounds. Even our lands are nearly all gone. Yes, my brothers, our campfires are few. Those that still burn, we must draw together. Behold what the white man has done to our people. Gone are the Pequot, the Narragansett, the Powhatan, the Tuscarora and the Cori. We can no longer trust the white man. We gave him our tobacco and our maize. What happened? Now there is hardly land for us to grow these holy plants. White men have built their castles where the Indians' hunting grounds once were, and now they are coming into your mountain glens. Soon there will be no place for the Cherokee to hunt the deer and the bear. The tomahawk of the Shawnee is ready. Will the Cherokee raise the tomahawk? Will the Cherokee join their brothers, the Shawnee? Tecumseh's message was not accepted by all. Cherokee chiefs believed their people could live with the Europeans. It has been years, many years, since the Cherokee have drawn the tomahawk. Our braves have forgotten how to use the scalping knife. We have learned with sorrow it is better not to war against our white brothers. We know that they have come to stay. They are like leaves in forest. They are so many. We believe we can live in peace with them. No more do they molest our lands. Our crops grow in peace. But Tecumseh found like-minded warriors among the Upper Creek Indians, particularly a band known as the Red Sticks. Tecumseh led these warriors and others who joined him in the Creek War. Initially, a civil war within the Creek Nation the Creek War expanded and essentially merged with the broader War of 1812. Tecumseh and the Red Sticks fought as allies of the British who supplied them. 
the United States military became embroiled in the Creek War in July 1813. The Red Sticks had gone to Spanish Florida, where they purchased arms and supplies, using money given to them by the British. When the local militia heard reports of the Creek moving the acquired arms through present-day Alabama, they struck the pack train, driving off the Red Stick Creek warriors. But when the militia turned to loot the Indian camp, they were struck by a fierce counterattack, and they retreated. After this incident, the local population, including Lower Creek Indians, who were loyal to the Americans, were concerned about future attacks by the Red Sticks. For safety, they gathered at Fort Mims, a little over 500 people, about half of them militia. Unfortunately, they had gathered in exactly the wrong spot. On August 29, 1813, an estimated 1,000 Red Stick warriors, led by Chiefs Peter McQueen and William Weatherford, struck Fort Mims. Most of the militia, settlers, and Creeks loyal to the Americans were killed or captured. The Red Sticks collected 250 scalps. One American who was driven to action by the massacre at Fort Mims was Tennessee native Davy Crockett. The Creek Indians had commenced their open hostilities by a most bloody butchery at Fort Mims. There had been no war among us for so long that but few who were not too old to bear arms knew anything about the business. I, for one, had often thought about war and I did verily believe in my own mind that I couldn't fight in that way at all. But my after experience convinced me that this was all a notion, for when I heard of the mischief which was done at the fort, I instantly felt like going, and I had none of the dread of dying that I expected to feel. Whether Davy convinced his wife or not, even he wasn't sure. But he marched off to fight a week later, expecting to be gone only a short time. His company joined up with General Andrew Jackson's force. In November 1813, they came to the rescue of another fort, this one held by Lower Creek Indians allied with the Americans. Davy Crockett's tale reminds us that the struggles between the Native Americans and European Americans were not simple, clear-cut affairs. It was not just a matter of white versus Indians. There were Indians on both sides of the battle, and the ones fighting the Americans were allied with the British. The war itself went on. Tecumseh was killed in 1813 at the Battle of the Thames, but his warriors continued to fight. Then, on March 27, 1814, over a thousand Creek warriors met a force three times their number, commanded by General Andrew Jackson at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend near Dadeville, Alabama. Jackson's men, which included a contingent of 600 Cherokee and Lower Creek allies, stormed the Creek fortifications. Jackson ordered a bayonet charge, and the forces fought hand to hand. 200 of the Red Stick warriors escaped, joining with the Seminole in Spanish Florida. But the rest, 800 warriors, were killed. Jackson forced the Creek to sign a treaty in August 1814, which ceded 23 million acres of Creek land in Alabama and Georgia to the United States government. This included lands that had belonged to the Lower Creek Indians and the Cherokee Nation, both of which had been allies to the Americans during the war. Chief Junaluska, the Cherokee leader who had argued against Tecumseh's call to war, who had led 500 Native American warriors as allies to the Americans, and who is credited with saving Andrew Jackson's life in the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, later said,
If I had known that Jackson would drive us from our homes, I would have killed him at Horseshoe. And it wasn't long before Andrew Jackson was leading troops against American Indian tribes again, this time in the Seminole Wars in Florida. Jackson's victories in this conflict eventually resulted in Spain ceding Florida to the United States. Indian Wars continued as America continued to look west. Further wars with the Seminole and the Creek, the Winnebago, and the Blackhawks were to come. Jackson's military successes led to his eventual election to president in 1828. As president, Jackson saw the acquisition of about 100 million acres of Indian land and the forced removal of the Choctaw and Cherokee to the Indian Territory in Oklahoma during the Trail of Tears. Davy Crockett, who had chafed under Jackson's leadership in the Creek War, was a congressman when Jackson was president. Crockett voted against Jackson's Indian Removal Act. I saw that it was expected of me that I was to bow to the name of Andrew Jackson and follow him in all his motions, even at the expense of my conscience and judgment. Such a thing was new to me and a total stranger to my principles. His famous, or rather I should say his infamous Indian bill was brought forward and I opposed it from the purest motives in the world. Several of my colleagues got around me and told me how well they loved me and that I was ruining myself. They said this was a favorite measure of the president and I ought to go for it. I told them I believed it was a wicked, unjust measure and that I should go against it, let the cost to myself be what it might, that I was willing to go with General Jackson in everything that I believed was honest and right. But further than this, I wouldn't go for him or any other man in the whole creation. As American Indians were forced west, other Americans followed the sunset as well, seeking their fortune. This included the mountain men, trappers, and fur traders who were at home in the wild. One such leader was Kit Carson, who served as a guide to Colonel John C. Fremont's surveying expeditions in the 1840s. Fremont's reports back to Congress spurred on wagon trains to the west filled with hopeful settlers. They also made Kit Carson famous. Carson wasn't a lawman, but in truth, there were no lawmen in that time and place. He and his fellow trappers lived in remote country, facing Native American attacks that were, however understandable, both terrifying and horrifying. John Fremont's expeditions with Kit Carson as his guide, went a long way toward opening up the West. Fremont's team produced a detailed map of Oregon and Upper California. Trappers and fur traders like Carson helped blaze the trails to the West. And over time, missionaries, settlers, prospectors, speculators, and more followed. They marched along the network of emigrant pathways that included the Oregon Trail, the Mormon Trail, the California Trail, and the Santa Fe Trail. In the early years, the Oregon Trail could only be traveled on foot or by horseback. In the mid-1830s, improvements allowed wagon trains to travel and the floodgates opened. But even before the Oregon Trail had developed to that point, there were Americans wanting to move into the West. During the 1820s, many headed to Texas, following the call of Stephen F. Austin. The government of Mexico, which held Texas, had only recently separated from Spain. Their resources were stretched tight, and they needed to increase their population in the hopes that local militias would then be able to resist Indian raids. The colonization movement was wildly successful, but most of the colonists were from the U.S. rather than Mexico. Tensions between the colonists and the Mexican government ran high, eventually exploding into a revolution 
in October 1835. The Texas Revolution included the famous Battle of the Alamo in San Antonio in March 1836, in which a small garrison of men held off 1,500 Mexican troops for 13 days. Davy Crockett was one of the men in that Catholic mission turned fort. In his last election, he said, I told the people of my district that I would serve them as faithfully as I had done, but if not, they might go to hell and I would go to Texas. Davy lost that election and arrived at the Alamo less than two weeks before the fort was surrounded by Mexican troops. When the Alamo fell on March 6th, almost all of the defenders were killed, including Davy Crockett. Cries of, remember the Alamo, inspired Texans who defeated Mexican forces at the Battle of San Jacinto on April 21st, 1836, winning Texas independence from Mexico. Texas then existed as an independent, sovereign nation until being annexed by the U.S. and admitted as a state, skipping the territorial stage in 1845. Again, the U.S. acquired a massive amount of land and the settlers continued to pour in. Uh, this is a uh, model 1841 U.S. rifle, uh, nicknamed the Mississippi, uh, not because it was made in Mississippi, but because a regiment of Mississippi volunteers commanded by a man named Jefferson Davis, who was later to become the president of the Confederate States of America, uh, commanded a regiment of Mississippi volunteers armed with the model 1841 rifle in the Battle of Buena Vista during the Mexican-American War. Uh, the Battle of Buena Vista was fought in February of 1847, and uh, the Mississippi Volunteers were instrumental in winning that battle for the Americans. They checked a, uh, uh, an assault by Mexican forces. This weapon is 54 caliber, and it's extremely unique because it is the very first shoulder arm in the U.S. arsenal with a percussion system. Uh, the percussion system is really quite simple. It has a cone or a nipple as it's called and a small uh, percussion cap would be fitted to that. The cap was full of a uh, uh, fulminating mixture called uh, mercury fulminate. Uh, when you cock back the hammer and depress the trigger, uh, the hammer strikes the cap sending a hot jet of flame through this bolster into a hole in the barrel, igniting the main charge. Uh, it's really loaded very much like any muzzle loader. The main cartridge would be uh, poured down the muzzle here and rammed home with the ramrod. Uh, because this weapon has a great deal of brass furniture, it uh, was considered a very attractive weapon for its time. It's got a brass muzzle strap up here, uh, brass band, brass trigger guard, patch box, and butt plate. In the wake of the annexation of Texas, America went to war with Mexico. American forces quickly captured New Mexico and California in 1846. Kit Carson played a significant role in the Mexican War and the capture of California. He had led Captain Fremont on another exploration expedition, but in this case, it was with the knowledge that war could be imminent. Fremont's men joined up with U.S. Navy Commodore Robert Stockton in July 1846 and helped in the capture of San Diego and Los Angeles. Carson was then detailed to deliver news of the capture of California to President Polk. Mexico ceded California to the U.S. in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in February 1848. In December of that year, President James Polk confirmed to Congress what was already spread by rumor. Gold had been found in California. 
And so the steady stream of people moving west became a flood. As many as 60,000 Americans traveled to California in 1849. San Francisco exploded from a population of 1,000 in 1848 to 25,000 in 1850. Some prospectors traveled the long way around by sea. Others took the Oregon and California trails. One of those who caught gold fever at the age of 14 was William Buffalo Bill Cody. Cody wouldn't earn his more famous nickname until after the Civil War, but he didn't move west to hunt buffalo. He was looking for gold. He didn't find it because along the way, he met an agent for the Pony Express and signed on. The Pony Express was in operation for just 18 months, from April 1860 to October 1861. But it is indelibly linked with the Old West. Although tens of thousands of Americans had moved west, they still wanted to communicate with the East. The riders faced serious dangers from hostile Indians and outlaws, not to mention the simple hazards of riding at top speed over rough ground. In November 1860, an editorial in the newspaper The Morning Transcript described the Pony Express and its impact on the lives of people on the frontier. Though but an infant institution, the pony has already become as familiar as the most familiar of household words to the people of California. Between it and the telegraph lines, which are being pushed toward Salt Lake City from the Mississippi Valley, and from California, time and space have been annihilated to a very remarkable extent. The news of the recent presidential election through the combined agency of the pony and the telegraph lines reached California in six days from St. Louis. A very few months ago, we thought our ourselves well off when intelligence reached us from the eastern side of the continent and from 23 to 30 days, the Pony has changed months into weeks. The Pony Express would soon be replaced by the telegraph, but in its brief existence, it captured for many the spirit of the West. Of course, there's a dark side to that spirit. As prospectors traveled west, hoping to strike it rich with a pan and a shovel. Others tried the same, but with a gun. Not everyone who moved west did so for gold. In 1847, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints began settling in what is now Utah in the summer of 1847. The Mormons hoped that the isolation would give them the freedom to practice their religion. But the California gold rush ended that hope. Mormons were pleased to see church leader Brigham Young appointed to be the first governor of the Utah Territory. At the time, the Church of Latter-day Saints supported plural marriage, polygamy a concept that was shocking to most of American society. In particular, the newly formed Republican Party was outspoken in opposition to polygamy, even linking it to slavery. Tensions continued rising until President Buchanan removed Young as governor and sent General-in-Chief Winfield Scott at the head of a 2,500-man force to enforce the laws of the new governor. When reports of the approaching army reached Utah, the Mormons organized their own militia to prevent the army from entering their territory. Cooler heads prevailed, and the so-called Utah War ended without a fight. The same could not be said for the other conflicts dividing the nation. The slavery question was coming to a boil. All of this national expansion kept raising the same crucial question. 
Will this new territory allow slavery? In the nation's infancy, the Northwest Ordinance described that part of the territory northwest of the Ohio River and declared that slavery would be prohibited in those lands. The prohibition of slavery did not apply to the territory south of the Ohio, continuing America's sectional divide in labor, ideology, and economy. When the Louisiana Purchase more than doubled the territory of the U.S., a new deal became necessary. The Northwest Ordinance did not address these new lands, and therefore, there was no limitation on slavery there. The Missouri Compromise in 1820 set new boundaries following the principles of the Northwest Ordinance. The deal came about because the people of the area that would become Missouri wished to join the Union as a slave state. This would have given slave states an advantage of one state in the Senate, and therefore, many Northerners were opposed. The compromise that resulted allowed the admission of Missouri as a slave state simultaneously with the admission of Maine as a free state. The compromise also prohibited slavery in the remaining territory north of Missouri's southern border, except within Missouri itself. In 1837, the policy of the Missouri Compromise continued, with Arkansas being admitted to the Union as a slave state, while Michigan was admitted as a free state. In 1850, difficulties broke out again. Another compromise was worked out, delaying a civil war just a bit longer. Then the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 changed the rules for determining whether a territory would be slave or free. Under the concept known as popular sovereignty, the residents of each territory would get to vote to decide whether slavery would be permitted. The act specifically repealed that part of the Missouri Compromise that outlawed slavery north of the line drawn in 1820. Stephen Douglas, the Illinois senator, hoped this would win him the support of Southerners, with his eye on an eventual bid for the presidency. But he did not consider the degree of opposition the bill would face in the North. In particular, he had no inkling of the future of one man in particular who would be energized by this act. Despite the opposition by many, the Kansas-Nebraska Act passed signed into law on May 30th, 1854. The question of slavery in each territory would be determined by the vote of the people living there. And so the stage was set for the most strident, short-tempered, zealous, and potentially violent proponents of both slavery and abolition to marshal their forces and run to Kansas to swell the ranks of voters for their side in hopes of winning the state. Pro-slavery settlers moved in from Missouri, with some showing up just long enough to vote. Meanwhile, abolitionist societies back east were funding settlers to add their anti-slavery votes. Thousands of pro- and anti-slavery men and families moved to Kansas planning to wage war at the ballot box, but also armed for a more physical confrontation. In the initial elections of November 1854, pro-slavery forces won out. Voter fraud was rampant. With only 1,500 registered voters, over 6,000 votes were cast. So-called border ruffians from Missouri crossed into Kansas to vote in that election for congressional delegate. In the 1855 election of a territorial legislature, they did it again, and pro-slavery forces were swept into office. A congressional committee determined that the election was improperly influenced by the border ruffians, but President Franklin Pierce recognized the legislature nonetheless. 
Free Soilers formed a shadow government in Topeka, which Pierce labeled as revolutionary. Tensions rose and political chicanery became open violence. On May 21st, 1856, a group of about 800 border ruffians entered the town of Lawrence, Kansas, which was under the control of free state settlers. They blocked off all roads out of town, preventing escape. Under a flag inscribed, Southern Rights, they smashed the printing presses in the town's two printing offices and threw the type into the river. They then set fire to the Free State Hotel. The most significant violent reaction to the sacking of Lawrence was led by a man who would gain greater infamy for another raid just a few years later. John Brown was a sheep farmer who had been dedicated to abolition for years, serving as a conductor in the Underground Railroad. When some of his large brood of sons moved with their families to Kansas in 1855, he learned from them of the attacks by pro-slavery forces. He left New York to join them, gathering weapons along the way. Brown was angered by the violence used by pro-slavery forces and the meekness of the Free State settlers. He joined a Free State military group along with some of his sons, and in the wake of the attacks of Lawrence and Sumner, he planned a violent retribution. James Townsley was enlisted by Brown to carry men and supplies in what would become the Pottawatomie Massacre. We then crossed the Pottawatomie and came to the house of Henry Sherman, generally known as Dutch Henry. They brought out William Sherman, Dutch Henry's brother, and marched him into Pottawatomie Creek, where he was slain with swords by Brown's two youngest sons and left lying in the road. I then thought that the transaction was terrible. However, I became satisfied that it resulted in good to the Free State cause and was especially beneficial to Free State settlers on Pottawatomie Creek. The pro-slavery men were dreadfully terrified and large numbers of them soon left the territory. Despite the outrage around this incident, none of the participants were arrested. Hundreds more would be killed in the War of Bushwhackers in Kansas. But in 1859, Free Soilers were able to elect a majority of the delegates to the territory's Constitutional Convention, and in January 1861, Kansas was admitted as a free state. But John Brown had already left Kansas behind. In 1859, he focused his attention on a new target, the government armory and arsenal at Harper's Ferry. He planned to use those weapons to arm what he expected to be an army of fugitive slaves that would join him but he failed to convince one important escaped slave. John Brown had long been a friend of Frederick Douglass. Douglass had preached pacifism prior to 1850, but in the wake of the fugitive slave law, he believed that he who would be free must himself strike the first blow. Brown appealed to Douglas to join him in the raid. Douglas tried to talk Brown out of the mission, but failed. He later said, I told him finally that he was going into a steel trap from which there was no escape, and that I did not see it as my duty to follow him. Douglas's prediction was correct. John Brown's mission was a failure. Half his men were killed during the raid, including one of Brown's sons. Most of the others, including John Brown himself, were captured and hanged. Four men escaped, including another of Brown's sons. John Brown died by hanging on December 2nd, 1859. This was one more event to shock the consciences of the American people and to put them into opposing camps 
on the rightness of Brown's cause, if not his methods. The raid on Harper's Ferry would be seen by many as the first shots fired in the Civil War. A war that would impact the nation and its people in many ways. One of those impacts was the teaching of hundreds of thousands of men to kill. Another was the deaths of countless fathers and older brothers, leaving young men needing to find their own way in an ever more violent world. Some would become outlaws like Jesse James, Cole Younger, Bloody Bill Anderson, Billy the Kid, and many more. Others would become lawmen, like Wild Bill Hickok, Virgil Earp, Pat Garrett, and Bass Reeves. And still others would try on both hats over time, carrying a gun on both sides of the law. Doc Holliday, Henry Newton Brown, Texas Jack Vermillion. But first, they'd have to survive a war. 